Welcome everyone to our Modern Day Mystery School Book Study 27, continuing our Death is Transition series on an incredibly popular topic, the phenomena of apparitions, also known as ghosts, inspectors, and hauntings. This is an invaluable series on after death states, because understanding death, if we can understand death, we can know the meaning of life. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them here because Eddie will be here with us in this very book study in July. It would be awesome to be able to answer your questions with him here in person. I will put a timestamp in for when the lesson actually begins as there are a couple things I want to share with you first. So watch for that timestamp if you want to skip ahead to the book study. A shout out and so much love to the beloved Chris Sheridan. He is host of Living the Inner Life. The podcast is here on YouTube. His channel is growing exponentially. Thank God. And if you are not already following him, please do so right now. Go. I'll wait. Now I'm going to put a link to his work in the show description. He commented last week on the episode that we did last week, and he said, once a human, always a human. And I want to clarify here that we were talking about reincarnation and Eddie's explanation that we humans do not reincarnate backwards. For example, we don't go from human into the animal or mineral kingdom. I did not mean that. What I meant was once we hit human, there's only higher realms to go. There are infinite higher realms beyond. Now, I don't think Chris meant that, but I just wanted to clear that up. Chris then writes, I can't help but want to hear more about your perspective and how the ancient wisdom has worked in your life, which is a very good point, Chris. <sighs> I should do that. I used to do that. I did Living Theosophy Shorts once a week where I would share with you in real time, real life dramas and the application of these ancient teachings in my daily life through all of the challenges that present themselves. And I should probably get back to doing those. Now this channel real quick has gone through several evolutions. Let me just explain if you're here now going, what the hell? First we did the audio books and they're still here. Then we did the Key to Theosophy book studies, Light on the Path book studies. Then during COVID, we went through the interviews with other dedicated theosophists and students on the path. We did the theosophical gathering circles. We had a lot of fun. But after a rather challenging and unpleasant episode back in 2021, through an association with two official theosophical organizations, one where the old school members of the board <clears throat> they said they were not fond of my efforts in trying to bring the teachings forth in the world of today, in the language of today. For example, the TikToks I did and all the modern day social media. I was slammed and some might even say blacklisted through this official Theosophical Society organization. Now, though I need to say here, very important, the Theosophical Society across the globe does have absolutely beautiful souls within their ranks. These people are compassionate, empathetic, unconditionally loving people who are serving and are happily applying the teachings through self-analysis, through self-reflection, through self-transformation. There are unfortunately many others who become blinded by their own light. They believe that the teachings are to remain within the walls of their exclusive libraries to be doled out through exclusive talks to those who pay membership fees. That's not dissimilar to what the church does. Eddie has called these folks garrulous parrots, and that description is scarily accurate. In response from that blindsiding sideswipe, I stepped away from my work here for over a year. I removed the name Living Theosophy, which I loved, and I believe there's nothing more important to do than to live these teachings. I changed the name to Voice of Compassion, but this week I changed it back. I received a message that lovingly read, you have done a lot for the Theosophical Society and for Theosophy itself. Much appreciated, I trust, by many, even though they do not actually say it to your face. So this week, when I changed it back, I realized it's not, it's not about me or my ego or getting hurt or any of that. I shouldn't let the actions and opinions of a few uppity dinosaurs take that from this channel. I'm not gonna. So when Eddie's Unfolding Consciousness came out a year ago, I recognized the massive importance of this collection of the ancient wisdom, and I knew I needed to get back in the saddle again. There are no dues here, no fees, no governing boards, no memberships, no organizations, leaders, or societies. There's no elitism. There's no ego, just the teachings and just working with the perennial philosophy and with Eddie, who is so refreshingly humble and good. His purpose for writing Unfolding Consciousness is to show that the universe, 
Man and all of nature is guided by intelligence at all levels. And the laws of nature are anything but blind and mechanical. They are intelligent powers. So let's get started. <clears throat> we continue through in volume two of Unfolding Consciousness. Again, exploring the living universe and the intelligent powers in nature and humans. That's you. This is researched referenced. So there's reference to all of these old occult teachings, these ancient teachings that's been written, compiled, and completely spelled out in Lionheart of Depth by Dr. Eddie Billamoria. In volume two, there's a subtitle here, which is Peering Down the Microscope, Man's Internal Landscapes, Looking Within the Human Being. So death is transition, time at the door of eternity. We are diving deep into the paranormal and ghosts and apparitions, specters and spooks, and we're on page 80. Now our yellow post-it notes, Eddie puts these on the side of every page so you know what's going on where, you can see them there, okay? This week it is how and when do apparitions appear? Malevolent apparitions and their circumstances, benign or harmless apparitions and their circumstances, and when the afterlife becomes earthbound. This is important stuff and the effect of grief. Don't forget you get 20% off the four volume hardback set by typing in UC Book Study at the Shepherd Walwyn website. So now that we have sketched out the supernatural explanation and aspect of death, what do we now make of all the stories that abound in legends of all over the world from every culture and religion about things that are generally known in the Western world under a variety of names like spooks or ghosts or ghouls? How do such apparitions occur? And do they have any consciousness to speak of? That's a very good question. So after the second death, where man is born again, or in other words, the spirit in man, your higher self, the higher ego, which is the triad of Atma, Bodhi, Manas, remember the tables we went over, has ascended into Devashan, heaven, there can obviously be no return to earth since there is then no connecting link. Released of its divine inhabitant, the higher ego, okay, the Kamarupa then, which is the desire body, becomes a psychic corpse, known in occult literature as a shell, in the same way that the body becomes a corpse upon physical death, just as a cast-off overcoat may retain the shape and the smell of its former wearer for a time, the discarded vesture, the shell of the higher ego, retains some of the characteristics of the deceased personality. In other words, being the residue of the mortal personality that was, the shell retains some residual consciousness for a while. For this reason, the shell is temporarily an exact astral duplicate in appearance and mannerism of the man who died, quite literally his eidolon or image. Left to its barely there semi-senseless self, the discarded kamarupa, the desire body, of the human being, the shell, subsequently degenerates when its residual psychic energies have evaporated, at which point its components are then recycled back to the psychic planes of the universe in the same way the physical body dies when it dies, the physical energies are spent and the debris of the physical corpse changes back into the physical plane, the material plane, Earth. However, when the discarnate, which means one who does not have a body, when the discarnate man is still strongly earthbound, for example, unable to loosen his earthly ties to persons, places, and possessions, the shell can hover in the terrestrial atmosphere and sometimes appear as an apparition. Now, seance room phenomena or mediumship demonstrations are due to the artificial activation of the shell by the vitality of the medium or those sitting in the audience before the former has had time to disintegrate. We'll say that again. Seance room phenomena are due to the artificial activation of the shell by the vitality of the medium, the life force of the medium or those in the room before the former has had time to degenerate. The overriding principle is that the time span of the Kamarupa, this time of this existence, and subsequently the shell, depends entirely on the sensual, pertaining to the senses, sensual energies of the man during life. In other words, the extent to which his thoughts have energized and fueled his desire nature, which, if not fully satisfied or exhausted during physical life, will have to expend its pent-up energies after death. So again, 
The length of time that a Kama Rupa or desire body is earthbound depends entirely on the sensual energies of the man during life. In other words, the extent to which his thoughts have energized and fueled his desire nature, which if not fully satisfied or exhausted during physical life, will have to expend its pent up energies after death. If the man has turned his thoughts towards a higher existence and loosened his grip on satiating his desire nature, then the shell may exist for a short time before disintegrating and releasing the immortal triad, which is Atma Bodhi Manas. But if forcibly drawn back into the earthly sphere, the spook, so named, may exist for a period greatly exceeding its natural existence in the Kama Loka. There are essentially two ways in which this can happen. If during earthly life, man has harbored strong passions or died with unfulfilled lustful appetites or with thoughts of murder or violence or revenge, then the spook made up of these pent up psychic energies could be attracted earthwards by the atmosphere of degenerate places. Note here, possibly I'm saying, I'm inserting this, bars and pubs, where there are available bodies whose minds are shut off and numbed by drugs and alcohol. They are also attracted to the auras of very self-indulgent people, or worst of all, by diabolical necromantic practices, which is black magic, or ignorantly summoning demons, etc. Once the Kamarupa has learned its way back into the living human experience, for example, they've established an attraction or a magnetic affinity with someone, it becomes a vampire, an energy vampire, feeding on the vitality, the life force of those who invited its company. Eddie notes here, in a sense, this is similar to the law of conservation of energy in physics, because on any plane, pent up energies cannot just disappear, they must find an appropriate outlet and release. In India, these Eidolons are called Pisachas and are flesh-eating demons of pure evil, as also in many other cultures. We have different names for them. It is precisely for this reason that capital punishment, execution, considered from the occult standpoint, is not to be recommended. A murderer in his body serving his life sentence in prison is a lesser threat to humanity than one who is forcibly thrown out of his body by execution with all of the criminal propensities in full flood, which only serve to poison the psychic atmosphere. The other case is that of a perfectly good and upright man who has suffered a sudden, invariably violent death in the prime of life. One that can instinctively feel that because such a man has not lived his allotted time span, the Kamarupa will be charged with unused psychic energies and affinities and attractions of all kinds to things left undone or to family ties left behind. The Kamarupa may then be drawn down into the terrestrial, the earthly atmosphere by the excessive grief of friends or loved ones. Such a ghost, though quite startling to see, is harmless and benign. There have been many reports of soldiers who were killed in World War II whose apparitions later appeared in their homes. You have heard of these stories. Their surviving colleagues have reported that when mortally wounded, many a young soldier would have cried out for his mother at the moment of death. For example, at the Battle of Normandy, that's D-Day, June 6, 1944. It is not difficult to envision that a strong, emotionally charged final thought of a dying young man towards his home and his mom, reinforced by the mother's own constant, unconditional loving thoughts towards her son on the battlefield, would result in a materialization taking place, unsurprisingly, in the bedroom of his former home. Such cases are substantiated in a book called In Times of War, Messages of Wisdom from Soldiers in the Afterlife, which documents conversations with soldiers who claim to have been near death or killed as a result of war. Many individual cases bear witness to the fact that soldiers who died suddenly sometimes appeared to loved ones with comforting messages to the effect that they were okay, that they're fine now. There are also noteworthy extracts from case histories known as the Wickland scripts, including apparent communications from the American businessman, real estate developer, and investor, John Jacob or Jack Astor IV who drowned in the Titanic disaster, reflecting on what he then realized, that his life had been self-serving instead of devoted to serving others. 
It seems that our knowing nothing about the possibility of after-death states of consciousness results in unnecessary difficulties during the transition to afterlife. It's important that we know this stuff. This view is supported by the British psychologist, parapsychologist, and author David G. J. Fontana, who possessed evidence to suggest that those who experience sudden death or have no belief in an afterlife may remain earthbound, that is, still attached and attracted to the material world, unaware in some cases that death has even occurred, and they're resentful at people coming in and enjoying their old home and their stuff. Again, evidence suggests that those who experience sudden death or have no belief in an afterlife may remain earthbound, that is, still attached to the material world in some cases unaware that death has even happened. And they're resentful, they're pissed that other people are in their home and playing with their stuff. It is said that such earthbound individuals may be responsible for poltergeist and perhaps other hauntings and possibly for influencing the thoughts and behavior of vulnerable people. For this reason, however hard and difficult it may seem, occult science counsels that overwhelming and extended grief beyond the natural course of bereavement is selfish because it holds back the departed from their onward journey towards heavenly or devashanic realms. The real tragedy is solely for those left behind in their personal bereavement and loss. It's not, this grief is not for the newly departed who has been, except for exceptional circumstances and rare circumstances, freed from all sorrow and pain, though temporarily. Now, I'm going to put a note here, this is for me, that it is true that both grief and guilt, who are we thinking about? In grief and guilt, we're thinking about ourselves. They are selfish emotions. They're natural, but they're selfish if we think about them. Paramahansa Yogananda says, of course, we would not be human if we did not miss our loved ones. But in feeling lonesome for them, we don't want selfish attachment to be the cause of keeping them earthbound. Extreme sorrow prevents a departed soul from going ahead toward greater peace and freedom. However, it should be noted carefully that not all materializations are the handiwork of the Kamarupa, the desire body. There are many other factors and phenomena at play, like the Linga Sharira, or the physical etheric double, or we call it the astral body as well, and the Mayavi Rupa, which is the non-physical, the thought body, or the dream body, created by the power of thought, which is also called Kriya Shakti. The Mayavi Rupa is composed of the principles of thought, lower mind, and desire. And these account in many cases for deathbed apparitions, especially during crisis. So next week, we move on to photos and pictures in support of ghosts and specters and the afterlife. Yes, please. Yes, please. We move forward in death is transition, time at the door of eternity, in unfolding consciousness, exploring the living universe and the dying universe in this series, exploring the living universe and intelligent powers in nature and humans, written and synthesized by Dr. Eddie Billamoria. How I love this, how important these teachings are. I cheekily say the modern day mystery schools, which has been used by other people online, but that's fine because this is what was taught within those mystery schools. It's not a mystery anymore. I can't think of anything more important to do. There's no other important subject or text. There is nothing more important for we humans to do. For understanding death, we can learn the meaning of life. The study, digestion, and application of these ancient teachings has changed my life exponentially, and that's what I do these book studies for. And I'm gonna take Chris Sheridan's brilliant advice to heart, and I will share how I use them and how they help me in future videos. So thank you, Chris. If you have any questions or comments, please, please, please leave them. Eddie will be here with us in July. It would be wonderful to answer your questions directly with him here. Remember the UC Book Study code, UC Book Study, type it in, save 20% on the Shepherd Walwyn website. These book studies are all about you. You are the reason I am here every Sunday because if you can understand them and they resonate with you, they will change your life as well. It helps get these ancient teachings out into the world if you like, share, and subscribe. So I appreciate you. Thank you so much for being here. I love you. I'll see you next week.